Good evening, Sheridan Hills family. This is Pastor Jason, and I'm looking forward tonight to sharing with you our devotional thought about the attributes of God in everyday life. Tonight we'll be looking at three attributes, God's omniscience, God's omnipresence, and God's omnipotence. As you can see, we were watching some of the service from Sunday morning, and the very first song we sang is, Look and See Our God. And tonight, that's what I want to do as we look into the God's Word and learn from God's Word and learn from specifically from David as he praises God for these attributes. I want us to look and see God and know Him more fully as we think about His characteristics and give Him all the praise that He is worthy of. So tonight, as we look at each one of these attributes, my plan is to give you an illustration to kind of help you to understand a little bit more of what omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence is. I also want to look into Psalm 139. So if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to grab it and open it up to Psalm 139. And then we're also going to look at some other places in Scripture that speak about uh, these attributes. So as you turn in God's Word, let me just remind you of one, the very first attribute that we come to in Psalm 139. It's the attribute of omniscience. Now, in 2007, a group of fishermen from New Zealand were down in the Ross Sea, which is in Antarctica, and when they saw something rather unusual in the water, they grabbed it, caught it with their fishing equipment that they had, and when they pulled it up on the boat, they were amazed to find that they had captured what was later called a colossal squid. A colossal squid is a squid that lives um, below 3,200 feet in the water. It has an eye that's as big as a soccer ball. So you can imagine the ability to see down in those depths with an eye like this. How could it do so? Well, Scientists seem to believe that since the eye is so big for the colossal squid that it traps every bit of light that is available at all at those depths, enabling the squid to be able to do things uh, like detect prey, search for predators, and see each other. Now these fishermen, when they found this colossal squid, they they found it eating a six-foot Pantagonian toothfish and that Pantagonian toothfish was uh, just shocking to them because they didn't realize how big squid could grow well as we think about God's omniscience and specifically as we think about what David has to say to us because I think when David is referring to God and speaking about these attributes here he's helping us to see in everyday life these attributes at work in and through us omniscience omniscience is the fact that god sees me and knows me you know god has perfect complete knowledge he never learns nor does he forget he knows all things that exist and all things that could have existed he cannot grow in knowledge understanding or wisdom proverbs 15 3 says this the eyes of the lord are in every place keeping watch over the evil and the good. And 1 John 3.20 says this, For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Now let's look and see what David has to say in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. Follow along as I read. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Now, what is David saying here? David is saying that God knows all about us. In verse 2, it tells us that God knows 
when we sit down and when we rise up. He knows all of our actions, all of our life's activities. It also tells us that God discerns. He knows our thoughts from afar, meaning He knows what we think. He knows our motivations. Verse 3 tells us, You search out my path and my lying down. He knows our habits and our daily behavior. And verses 4 through 6 tell us that God even knows what we say or what we were even thinking we were going to say. So he knows what we say before we say it. And David's response to all these things as he was thinking about it is that he says, you, him, me, in. God protects us. God guards us as valuable objects. He has absolute control. And verse 6 reminds us about God's omniscience, that his knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. David calls God's omniscience too wonderful, too extraordinary, too surpassing for him to grasp fully. Even Charles Spurgeon said this, Such knowledge not only surpasses my comprehension, but even my imagination. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 through 30 says this, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Omniscience is telling us that God knows us. He knows the depths of our soul. He knows us better than even we know ourselves. Better than anyone else. He can't learn anything about us because he knows all about us. We're going to see later that he knows us because he created us. But what are the implications of this omniscience that God has, this attribute of omniscience that God has? Well, we can feel secure and comforted by realizing that God sees and God knows everything. We can be challenged to think and act at all times like we live in public for God is always our audience and let's just be honest when we think about the omniscience omniscience should bring conviction because our secret sins the sins that we think we hide God knows God knows the sins that are even thought and didn't come out into action God knows all of them. So we should recognize that if we don't know Christ who paid our debts, knowing that every action and reaction and thought and motivation and impulse, every word we say was, or every word we were going to say, and every place we've gone will be revealed or exposed on the day of judgment. Because 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, The Lord will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. And we have no excuse. So it should bring conviction. But not only should it bring conviction, it also should bring freedom. Because God knows all about us. We don't have to act like we're something we're not. We can be free to be all that God has created us to be. It should also lead us to serve Him. Knowing that He knows our past, He knows the present, He knows the future. We can rest in Him. And we can serve Him in a way that gives Him glory. And lastly, obviously, it should cause us to want to worship Him. Because He is worthy of our worship and praise. He is the all-knowing one. And we should be in awe of that. Isaiah 49, 16 says, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. So because of God, because of God's infinite understanding, because nothing can be hidden from His sight, 
we can trust that he will not make mistakes and that he desire, his desires will come to pass. Without God's omniscience, we cannot trust that he would not make mistakes or that nor can we trust in absolute assurance of a future resurrection or the eternal dwelling with God. But yet omniscience is one of those attributes that demonstrates the majesty of God. But as we continue in Psalm 139, we also note not only does David point out God's omniscience, he points out God's omnipresence. In my office here, I have many memorabilia from when I was serving as a missionary in Africa. I was just reading an article recently about lions. And it tells us that lions are ambush predators. They rely on stealth and the element of surprise in order to bring down their prey. I don't know if you have ever had the experience of going to a place like Africa on a safari But in the darkness, you begin to wonder what is all around you. And when the lions begin to roar, you begin to really (laughs) worry because you begin to notice there are lions everywhere out here. Well, it's interesting in this article that I was reading, it was telling us that since there's ambush predators, as soon as they lose the element of surprise, as soon as their prey sees them, they abandon their hunt because they have a limited amount of energy that they want to use to catch that prey. Well, it's interesting. As we think about that and we think about the element of surprise and we think about how lions surround their prey to ambush them, it reminds me of God's omnipresence, that He surrounds us. 1 Kings 8.27 says this, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. David says this in Psalm 139, verse 7 through 12. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that's in the depths of the earth, You are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Jeremiah says it this way in Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. And in Acts 17, Paul said this in Acts 17, 27. He said, yet, when speaking about God, he said, yet he is actually not far from each of us. As David more fully understood God's omniscience, it prompted him, maybe it prompted him to want to run. But what he noticed, or what he noted here, is that God is always with us. Verse 8 tells us that God is in heaven. Verse 8 also points out that in the place of the dead, the grave, or by implication that could be the afterlife, God is there. Verse 9 shows us that He is in the farthest parts of the sea. And verse 11 through 12 tell us that He is in the darkness. No creature is hidden from His sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him whom we must give account. Now, the implication of the omnipresence of God is that it should be comforting to know that God is always with us. Comfort. Right? Because we find comfort because we know that God is near us all the time. We can say with the psalmist here that we are never out of range of the sight of God. When we think about His 
omnipresence. David even says it later on in this psalm, in 17, verse 17 and 18, How precious are your thoughts to me. When I awake, I am still with you. God stays with us. He helps us in a time of need and loves and understands us. But let's also be mindful that this is also a warning. Not only does this attribute give us comfort, but it also gives us a word of warning in the fact that we do not escape the presence of God. And it should be a warning to keep us from sin. You know, in the Roman Empire, the whole world was one great prison to a criminal. Because a criminal, even in his flight, as he tried to flee the Roman governing authorities, there was no place where the emperor could not track him. So it is under the government of God. No sinner can escape the eye of the judge. And again, that should bring conviction for us. And knowing that we are exposed, we are brought into the light, we are fully seen by God and fully observed by God. It also should be an encouragement to us that we can worship God anywhere and know that God is near to us, as Paul said earlier. And lastly, even in these difficult times, it should cause us to be able to say, you know what, I feel God is here with me and experience God's presence. Well, the last attribute that, that David covers here in the book of Psalm 139 is this attribute of omnipotence. Now, for me, as I think of omnipotence, I think about one of my favorite competitions that I used to watch on ESPN. It's the world's strongest man competition. Men gathering from all over the world to compete in various events like a monster truck pull, counting the number of deadlifts that they make or the overhead lifts that they have, counting how many times they can lift up a car. Crazy, crazy things, right? But watching them flip a pole, like a power pole over a bar, those kind of things just put me in awe and, and every time I would uh, have an opportunity to sit and I, I would see it come on I would be in, I, I, I would be wanting to watch it because I was just amazed by the feats of strength that these men had one of the events is called lifting atlas stones each stone weighs over 500 pounds and what they would do is they would have to lift it up over yokes and uh, in, in timed in a timed event and the first person obviously would be crowned the world's strongest man as I think about that I think about Psalm 115 1 through 3 it says this not to us O Lord not to us but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness why should the nation say where is your God our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said this, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. As David was reflecting on this and praising God for this attribute of omnipotence, listen to what he said in Psalm 139, sorry, verse 13. For you form my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days were formed for me, and when as yet there were none of them, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast are the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. You see, as we think about God's omnipotence, He can do all His will in accordance with His nature. He knows us, as David points out. He knows us before we are even born. Many of you may know this verse. Verses 13 through 15 that talks about how God forms our inward parts. How he knits us together. 
When I think about that idea of knitting, I think about when Kelly would make a crochet blanket and how she would carefully knit it together to make that blanket. Verse 15 says that our frame is not hidden from Him. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven or embroidered in the depths of the earth. So He knows us before we were born. But not only that, He schedules our day. Verse 16 reminds us of the divine providence. In your book, He says, are written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. So God knows every single day. God knows all that we are going to go through every day and is intricately involved in it. Lastly, as I pointed out in verse 17 and 18, we see that he, his thoughts and he thinks about us constantly. As we think about the omnipotence of God and we think about how in his power he thinks about us, he cares for us, that he can do all his will in accordance with his nature. I should find rest in that and comfort in that. The implications for believers is, that are, is this fact that we should be humbled and comforted as we trust and serve our God who can accomplish whatever he pleases and who is not hindered by human limitations. You see, our God is omniscient and knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us, but yet He still loves us. Our God is also omnipresent. He's always with us. Even if we go up or go down, east or west, in light or in darkness, He knows us. And lastly, our God is omnipotent. He is all powerful and we can rest in that he beautifully created us and recreates us to be a new creation in christ he knows us even when we are weak scripture tells us that he is strong his arm is not too short to save and there is nothing that is impossible with god so as we think about this text, as we think about what David had to say here, may we say, O oh Lord, may these truths take our breath away like it did David's and even more so in Christ. At the end of Psalm 139, David's response to this revelation of God and these attributes of God caused him to call for God to establish His righteousness and justice. He also asked God to continuously search Him. In verses 23 and 24, it says this, Search me, O God. Quoting again what he said at, in the first verse, in verse 23, he says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So as we think about these three attributes, I pray that it will challenge you and encourage you to rest in the Lord, to ask the Lord to search you as David did here, and ask the Lord to lead you in His omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you at this time, and Lord, we thank you and praise you for these three attributes. How they just speak to your greatness. And Lord, may we not look to ourselves during this time. May we not get in a cocoon and focus and think about, woe is me during these difficult days. But may we look and see our God. And God, may it cause us to celebrate you. To praise you that we can have a relationship with you because of your gracious gift of your son Jesus. We thank you for our identity in Christ. And may we rest in that. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Now as you take this time I would encourage you to think about praying specifically for the school as it begins. 
Many of our teachers are here on campus and students are preparing, gathering up their school supplies and those things for school to begin. And I would encourage you to pray for our students, pray for our teachers that they would be godly examples before the students, that they would have wisdom as they speak to students and uh, as they encourage students and correct students, and pray for our administration at the school that they would have wisdom to know how to navigate these difficult times during the COVID pandemic. So take some time and please pray for the school. And also please pray for your church leaders here as we think about and the church and how we carefully proceed in gathering together and spending time like this and, and teaching you via video which we know is not the best. We know the best is in person. But as we navigate these waters as well, Sheridan Hills family, we love you. And I hope you have a blessed night. God bless you.